I was asked to introduce Paul Krugman, but of course that's kind of silly because you're all here, you must know who he is already. So what I thought I would do instead is uh, quote Paul Krugman. <laughs> and uh, he had a very nice entry in his uh, blog a few days ago. He said, back when Hillary Clinton described Dick Cheney as Darth Vader, a number of people pointed out this was an unfair comparison. For example, Darth Vader once served in the military. <laughs> but he had an even better reason why the comparison was invalid. The contractors that Darth Vader hired to build the Death Star actually got the job done. <laughs> so it occurred to me after reading this, that, uh, you know, who is Paul in the Star Wars oh, trilogy? Yeah. You know, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, you know, the beard gives it away. Yeah. I give you Obi-Wan Krugman. <laughs> so, uh, I was sure, I, I was actually sure that I was going to turn out to be one of the uh, Ewoks or something there. Or, or, <laughs> all right. Um, so look, um, I'm here on what is, um, uh, I'm, I'm here on book tour. And I have a book, and I think a number of, of copies have been given out. But I'm going to indulge myself. So I have this book. Uh, um, I've given the book talk about 50 times uh, in, uh, in about 25 cities. Uh, so I'm turning this off. I'm not going to do a, a Rudy Giuliani uh, and, and take a call from my wife in the middle. So. Um, uh, so I have this book, and I, I urge you to read it, and especially I urge you to buy it, multiple copies. Uh, and, uh, and maybe in the questions, it'll, you know, some of the topics will come out. The book is very much about politics. It's about the long term. Uh, but I thought uh, we were just talking about this over lunch. I decided to change uh, uh, and not to give the book talk. And instead, talk about what's, uh, what's worrying me and what, what's on my mind right now, uh, and in fact, give an economics talk. Because uh, these are interesting times. Uh, there is apparently no such thing as that the, the legendary Chinese curse. If anything, it may it about live, may you live in interesting times. Uh, it, it's, it may actually have Scott's origins, but anyway. But we do live in interesting times, um, and we're having a really, really interesting uh, and fairly scary uh, financial uh, crisis. And so I thought I'd talk for a bit about you know what what we understand, what I think I understand about it, and. Uh, and what I don't understand, and where, where we are, which makes it, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, you should know, by the way, that before before I began writing for the Times, uh, you know, international economics is my home field um, and various strands. So I mean, I started out writing this wonderful things you can do as an academic. My first work was about you know why is there international trade, uh, but which is a small topic. But the uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the other strands was that I. Uh, I invented currency crises. Uh, not, not the thing itself, but the academic field, actually, in, in, in 1979. And, um, and ever since, business has been good. Um, and, uh, um, and I spent a lot of time doing, uh, doing you know, traveling to Southeast Asia, traveling to South America, talking you know, uh, in, in the previous life. And I haven't done much of that. Um, is since uh, in the last eight years, since I began writing for the Times, and sometimes actually people from Argentina ask, you know, why aren't you writing about our things anymore? And I say, you know, I'm trying to save my own damn republic. Um, but the, um, uh, but now it turns out that we're having kind of an interesting, uh, not quite a currency crisis. There's a currency aspect to it, but we're having a financial turmoil that is kind of up my alley, and we're having it right here. Uh, or more accurately, we're having it mostly on Wall Street, but we're having it anyway. It's, it is in the United States, and it's uh, so it, it it's <clears throat> and it's, it's actually I know I'm making jokes. It's it's it is reasonably scary uh, in in a number of ways, uh, uh, but it's anyway it's, it's a very interesting situation. So so let me talk about the economy right now because it is a uh, not so much the economy at large because there's some things I don't uh, you know I'm not going to tell talk, talk to you about. Uh, freight car loadings and, and all of those things that are supposed to be early warnings of what's happening, but instead about the financial situation. Um, OK, so we have a financial crisis. Uh, I think you can fairly call it a financial crisis. We don't know how badly it, it will af affect the real economy yet, uh, but it's very real <coughs> disruption <coughs> in the markets. And, and there, there are a couple of clues to it. Uh, first of all, it's just if you talk. You know, there, there are whole parts of the financial markets that basically just shut down. 
There are, you can't sell asset-backed commercial paper. You can't, uh, there are types of, of transactions that normally occur a lot um, that, that are not occurring at all. There are yields in the, there are, there are kinds of investments that are normally considered equivalent and should be arbitraged and should be just the same, uh, just about the same yield uh, that do not. So uh, <coughs> um, uh, my favorite indicator, which I'm checking all the time, is something called the TED spread. Uh, which is the difference between the three-month uh, LIBOR, London Interbank Offered Rate, where banks lend to each other in dollars, um, and uh, in London, except you know that it's really in cyberspace. But anyway, it's 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 uh, it used to be, uh, but it's it's banks lending to each other, and the three-month Treasury bill rate, which is lending money to the federal government, and those normally. Li uh, um, Three-month LIBOR should be uh, 30 or 50 basis points, 3.3 uh, .3 to 0.5% higher, just because there's a little bit of, of risk involved, but not much. And now, it's, these days, it's, it's more than, than two, per, uh, two percentage points higher than, than the, 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 the TED spread, which is kind of saying that, that banks reasonably, I, th I think it's saying that, that banks uh, lending to each other think that there's something like a one in 10 chance that the, the whole financial system will seize up and, and they will lose a lot of money on loans to each other in the next year. So it's a, uh, it, 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 there are these, you know, these spreads, they're saying there's a lot of risk in the system. Um, you know, how did that happen? Uh, they, the last time anything like this happened was in 1998 uh, when long-term capital management went uh, bluey. And um, uh, there were a few weeks of, uh, of terror. Uh, I actually happened to be at a meeting at the Federal Reserve of New York in 1998 when we looked at, uh, oh, there we go, uh, right in the middle of that and got a briefing from officials there. And, and the, uh, the then president of the New York Fed told everybody about this. And then somebody said, well, what do we do about this situation? And this is in 1998. And he said, uh, pray. Um, and uh, in fact, it was resolved quite handily back in 1998. And then in August of this year, we had a return of financial conditions strongly reminiscent of September 1998. Um, and as before, there was the, what it looked like a pretty speedy resolution. And things improved. And then they got worse again. And so now if you go to, uh, to the Fed, they will show you charts comparing this crisis with 98. And they look the same for the first month and a half and then start to get worse again. And so we have this uh, very serious, uh, very serious, at least if you, if from the financial markets point of view. So let me tell you the story about how we got here and then mysteries about how we get out. Um, so the story. Um, <clears throat> OK, so we had an amazing bubble in housing in the United States. Uh, it, that story really begins with the tech crash at the beginning of the decade. Uh, so um, obviously dot coms all go, go bust and <coughs> uh, leading to us uh, a lot of paper wealth disappears, consumption goes down. Uh, even more important, telecom investment went way down. It turns out the bigger story in that recession is actually that there were all these telecom investments in, in fiber that at that point no one had any use for. And when those stopped, that was a big reduction in demand. And so the economy went to a recession. It was not by any means the worst recession that we've had by a long shot. Uh, but it was sustained. It was, took a, it was hard to get the economy really going again. And so the Federal Reserve cut interest rates and kept cutting them and eventually down to about 1%. Uh, down to 1% actually on the Fed funds rate. Um, the, at the same time, the, the Federal Reserve controls very short-term interest rates. The long-term rates came way down too, partly because of the Fed's action, partly because something else was happening, which was the uh, uh, money flowing in from abroad. Huge amounts of, of funds coming in. Um, we talk a lot about China, which is at that point was the biggest source. Uh, there are now, right now if you look at it, it's sort of, um, uh, three parts. It's Japan, which is actually the part that sort of looks like it might be sustained. Uh, there's China, which is just weird, and there's oil exporting countries, which are also acquiring a lot of dollars. And all of these countries uh, pouring money <coughs> into, um, into U.S. assets, primarily either U.S. government debt or debt of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are quasi-governmental, or at least are thought to be. So there's all this money coming in, all of which made interest rates low and made home buying kind of attractive. So people started buying houses. And the prices started going up. 
and classic bubble. As the prices went up, people started to say, well, they're going to go up more. And that made home buying seem even more attractive. And uh, um, OK, so we developed a, a really um, uh, impressive uh, uh, rise in home prices that was out of line with historical relationships. So you have various measures people look at. Uh, my favorite is to look at um, the, we have an index which is supposed to measure uh, uh, rent or the, the equivalent, uh, basically, it's basically a measure of what, what people pay in rent. So it, it's kind of an indication of what it, what it costs to have housing if you don't want to buy it uh, versus the price of housing. And that relationship has fluctuated in a fairly narrow range historically. It's actually, it's kind of like the price earnings ratio for stocks. Conceptually, it's very similar. Um, and <coughs> beginning um, early years of this decade, it just moved way out of that range. So nationally, um, it, it went to about 50% above its historical range, um, which is, but in a way, that's misleading because it's very, very different across different parts of the country. So I once uh, did these thing. I said, do you want to think of the United States as being two countries as far as housing is concerned? Uh, part of it is flat land. Uh, which is where there's essentially unlimited land and, and no zoning constraints. You just build additional houses. And the price of houses is the price of building a house. Uh, end of story. And that includes not just uh, you know, the Great Plains, but includes cities like Houston uh, or Atlanta, uh, where, where they just sprawl. And then there's the zone zone, which is places where land is scarce, where there are zoning restrictions, uh, and where this bubble really took off. Only about. 35% of the US population lives in those zone zone areas. Uh, but uh, most of the home value is in those areas because they're the expensive places anyway. And when you look at zone zone regions, you find that you had uh, prices going to um, 70%, 80%, 100% above what the historical relationships told you they should have been. Uh, of course, here we're in one of the. Uh, the, the, real, the real worst areas were uh, San Diego and Fort Lauderdale, but, uh, but, but look pretty bubblicious here, too. So, uh, and, and, and to some extent, though not quite as much in, in central New Jersey, where, where I am. Uh, um, and uh, so we had ended up with this situation with uh, all of this money coming into the United States, low interest rates, huge housing bubble, um, which was, in turn, both leading to a lot of uh, employment and construction, a lot of demand from housing, and also to a lot of consumer spending, because people could, um, could and did refinance their, their mortgages uh, as a way of extracting some of their increased housing wealth. So I, I actually summarized uh, the state of the US economy in 2005, saying that basically, as Americans, we made a living by selling each other houses with money we bar buying them with money we borrowed from China. That was the kind of the description of the US economy two and a half years ago. Um, OK, um, there's something in economics we call Stein's Law, uh, which is after Herbert Stein, the uh, uh, economist, advisor to Gerald Ford, and father of the much less funny Ben Stein. Um, the, uh, and uh, Herbert Stein's, uh, Stein's Law is if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, this thing was going to stop. Um, and it's been stopping in stages. Uh, it's, it, the, the housing bubble is deflating now across uh, the country. Um, it's it, at different degrees in different places. But it seems to be, you know, really, really the sales have, have come to a, a screeching halt. Prices are coming down. Um, houses are not like stocks. The price doesn't plunge to clear the market. Uh, what happens when demand slacks off is that the, a huge inventory of unsold houses build up and prices sort of gradually grind down, which is what's happening now. Um, and uh, um, a reasonable estimate is that uh, the uh, prices, at least prices relative to these fundamentals, prices in real terms have got to come down around 30% nationally, which means much more in some regions. And so that's, uh, that's a big price fall. Now, some of it can happen simply if house prices fail to rise while overall inflation goes on. But uh, for what it's worth, I, there's probably nobody here who remembers this. I was just going to say, uh, Southern California had a bubble and burst bubble in the late 80s and into the, <coughs> into the 90s that quantitatively looked sort of similar to what's happening to the United States as a whole right now. 
So the bubble just in Southern California is now national. If you look at what actually at the actual bubble in Southern California this time around, it's even it's much bigger. But it's sort of the average numbers. And that one, it took about. It was, in fact, a 30% real decline in, in house prices from their peak. And it took about six years to get there. So six years of a deeply depressed housing market, gradual falling, grinding down of home prices. Uh, gives you some, some idea of what kind of a siege we're in for. OK, um, now I can tell you one of those things that economists rarely get to say, which was, um, I predicted this. Uh, I actually got this one. <laughs> You know, I, I made some big bloopers in my time, but this one I got right. I saw that the housing thing was a bubble. Um, I think part of the reason it wasn't as clear as it should have been uh, was, the, was that a lot of people were looking at the national averages, which were certainly out of line. But to really get a sense of how crazy it was, you had to look at, at the sub-regional. You had to look at, at uh, um, uh, coastal, coastal Florida or Southern California to, to get a sense of just how far out of line things were. Um, OK, what I did not understand uh, during all of this was how much havoc the bursting of the bubble would wreak on the financial system. And this is the thing that, that has come as a really, really alarming surprise. Um, so uh, oh, and I should say, by the way, the one piece that really has not dropped um, is, although, is the financing of the US from abroad. Although there's been, the dollar has fallen a lot against the euro. It has not yet fallen against the, the renminbi, uh, the yuan, the Chinese currency. Um, fallen much less against the yen. So there's still a lot of adjustment on that side to go. Uh, but that, in some ways, is the thing that worries me least. Uh, we are, meanwhile, having this thing on the, um, on, the, uh, on the financial side. So here's what was happening while we were all thinking about other stuff. Um, um, OK, we had a, um, uh, one of these days, people are going to say, when, when, when people use the words financial innovation, uh, people are going to run screaming. Because uh, it turns out that it can be a very dangerous thing. Um, so all right, now, you know, once upon a time, you bought a house with a loan from a bank, uh, maybe a savings and loan. And the bank, um, first of all, would probably insist that you have 20% down. Uh, and it would set an interest rate, and you'd borrow for 15 or 30 years. And you'd, you'd, you know, that was it. And then the bank would, would hold on to the loan. Long since that stopped being the case. So loans, uh, uh, banks sell off the loan to uh, to someone else, and really, um, it, the, the loan is packaged together with a bunch of other loans, and um, and then shares in this, you know, this this big basket of loans are sold, and that's a, that's the process of securitization. And actually, that began a lot. Um, a lot of the securitization was made possible by government agencies, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, which would, in fact, uh, uh, subsidize, uh, insure, make this whole process go. Um, and they would, uh, they would, however, also have. Uh, uh, there were fairly strict criteria. The, the government, uh, the government-sponsored agencies. This, if you get into this stuff, there are three and four letter thingies, uh, CDOs, GSEs, uh, um, SIVs. It, it's, it, it's alphabet soup. But anyway, the, uh, the, um, the government sponsored agencies have quite strict criteria. A certain amount of money down, the size of the loan can exceed a certain amount, the, the terms have to be fairly standardized. Um, so borrowers who meet all of those criteria are prime borrowers. Uh, and uh, what turned out happened in this, in this decade was the rise of subprime loans to people who didn't meet the criteria, loans that didn't, uh, didn't fit all of that. And subprime is, there's always been some of it, uh, but it really, really uh, took off in the middle years of, of this decade. Um, so if you look, even in 2000, only about 8% of mortgage loans were subprime. Uh, but in 2004, 2005, 2006, it's 20% of loans were subprime. So just uh, most of the subprime loans that you hear about were made in the uh, uh, basically at the height of the housing bubble, uh, which is, turns out to be really crucial for understanding how we got into this mess. Um, how does that? Uh, actually, one of the things that I find amazing is why people were so willing to, to invest in this stuff. 
so you, what you had, um, I, maybe I should back up. The housing bubble, it seems to me, is a lot less forgivable than the, than the tech bubble of the 90s. Uh, the tech bubble, there was this amazing new technology, great stuff. You could, you know, and it was sort of possible to imagine that every, uh, Every company uh, was going to be the next Microsoft, uh, and or you know I, that that there was some reason to think that all the rules might have changed, but you know housing uh, hasn't changed that much. Uh, but nonetheless, people were able to convince themselves somehow that all the rules had changed uh, on housing as well. That that there was some that all the old rules about what was prudent no longer applied. Um, actually, I, I just on the Times blog I just suggested that there should be a, a follow-on to Stein's law. Uh, which, uh, which, uh, which I decided to call Glassman's Law. Um, uh, tell you about who Glassman is. Uh, the corollary to Stein's Law is if something cannot go on forever, uh, if it goes on for a while, there will people, be people devising elaborate theories of why it can. Um, uh, and um, there are actually versions of this all over the place. So uh, uh, the, uh, in, in the case of the US, US trade deficit, there is a whole raft of theories about why, in fact, with the US can, can uh, uh, buy twice as much as it sells from, the, uh, buy twice as much from the world as it sells to the rest of the world forever, and so on. But, um, and uh, in the case of housing, there are all kinds of things. Uh, but anyway, who's Glassman? Uh, Glassman is the co-author of uh, Dow 36,000, that, that 1999 bestseller. Uh, and the very day I, I posted that and uh, suggested that as a, uh, as a corollary, uh, I didn't know this, but I posted that early in the morning, and later in the day, it was announced that the um, Karen Hughes, the um, U.S. Uh, you know, selling U.S. views of, um, uh, abroad, uh, has resigned, and her new replacement appointed on that day is James K. Glassman, the author of Dow 36,000. <laughs> so this is to lend credibility to America and the world. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, so financial innovation. Uh, what made subprime, which had always been something that was a very limited thing, what made that suddenly so attractive? And the answer was financial innovation, uh, a way of packaging it. Um, the question was, how can you, uh, you know, who's going to invest in securitized mortgages that consist of all of these slightly flaky um, subprime loans? Uh, and the way that they dealt with that was the collateralized debt obligations. Um, so there's a... Uh, um, you would take a basket of subprime mortgages and sell um, contingent claims on different pieces of the income stream. So people are paying their mortgage payments and you would have the, these different pieces, tranches, by the way, the uh, um, slice. Uh, the, but the term is uh, that people always use in the financial stuff is tranches. So you'd have a, <clears throat> a first tranche that would um, have first dibs on any income coming out of the mortgages. And then there'd be a second tranche which would get money only if you were getting full payments up to the amount contracted for the first tranche. And then a, sec a third tranche and so on, sometimes up to, to, uh, to 16 tranches. Um, and the theory was that even if a lot of these loans went bust, um, there would still be enough money coming in to, to fill the, uh, the, the first tranche. So that, that even though the, the underlying mortgages were kind of flaky, uh, through this you know, um, uh, engineering, financial engineering, you would have created something that was a, a pretty safe asset. Uh, and the other stuff people would buy because they were willing to take on risk. They, they would be offered high rates of return if, if nothing went wrong and then you know, uh, accepting that it might not go wrong. But that the, the primary, the, the top, tranche would be a, a really safe asset. And, so, and, and the rating agencies agreed. So Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Fitch were willing to classify the top tranches of these things as, uh, as AAA rated debt. And so it was a way to, to uh, you could then get respectable investors, institutional investors, uh, uh, funds that were holding the money for the Florida school teachers and so on to invest in these things. Um, <clears throat> OK, so what happened? Um, by the way, there's a. Um, uh, there's a memo uh, that was circulating on Wall Street, which had a uh, describing a proposal for a new kind of collateralized debt obligation, and it became a collateralized overlapping. Uh, at, at the, 
I probably shouldn't be doing this. It's going to go on YouTube, right? Uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the acronym turned out to be colostomy bags, uh, which, would be, um, which would be filled with structured high interest transactions. Um, and uh, um, the, um, OK. Here's what actually, here's what actually happens. Um, the, the real problem, part of the problem, actually there's been, a, there's been a lot of misemphasis in this. People have been talking about, well, these were loans made to people who should not have gotten loans, um, which is arguable. But what turns out to be really the problem is not that. And there's actually some research now from the Federal Reserve of Boston showing this. What really happened was that this became, the, this whole process became a way of giving people a lot of um, lending to buy houses with little or no money down right at the peak of a housing bubble. Um, and it's not just new home buyers, by the way. A lot of subprime lending would involve people refinancing, people who already owned a home, refinancing to take out a mortgage that then came much closer to the, to the actual value of the home. And, uh, and then, um, and that in turn would, um, uh, you know, the, it would be, to, to borrow up to that much, they'd end up going subprime. But so it ended up that, that it was mostly a way of getting you know, lots and lots of, um, of debt. Uh, there's also appears to have been a quite substantial amount of uh, uh, essentially predatory lending. Uh, people, they, as um, uh, Ned Gramlich, Federal Reserve governor, uh, who died uh, just a few months ago, but he, he uh, wrote an anguished essay uh, saying that you know, the most complex loans, the most uh, difficult to understand are actually being made to the least sophisticated borrowers. Uh, lower income people, often uh, immigrants, uh, were, were getting complex loans that had low teaser rates that suddenly shot up and uh, complex terms and they, they were, so there were probably a lot of people who were being steered into products that were really just very bad for them. But in any case, the, the whole effect was to, uh, to get a lot of people borrowing up to the hilt and borrowing up to the value of their homes just at a point when home prices were way out of line with any normal concept of fundamentals. Um, and then the bubble burst. And um, so you take, um, <coughs> right now we've had a, uh, depending on which measure you use, but either a slight decline or uh, a 5% decline. There are some data problems. There are two different widely used indices. And they're not telling quite the same story. But anyway, home prices are certainly on their way down. Uh, and you have large numbers of people who borrowed uh, 95 or even 100% of the value of their home and bought it at peak prices. Um, and the result is that you have a rapidly growing number of people who are, have negative equity, have home mortgages that are worth more than the house. Um, this is bad. Uh, and first of all, it, it means that in uh, non-recourse states, which is a good part of the country, uh, a non-recourse state is where if, uh, if you simply walk away from your house and the mortgage, end of story. They can't, the, the, uh, the mortgage holder can't come after you f uh, further. That varies very much across states. But in a non-recourse state, if you, have a, uh, if you have a house that with a mortgage, if you have a $300,000 mortgage and a $200,000 house and you can't see any prospect that any time in the, in the foreseeable future the house will be worth more than three hundred thousand. There's a strong incentive to just walk away, um, or uh, even if you are, uh, <coughs> if that's not the situation, if you're having a, if you're in financial difficulty for whatever reason, uh, you lost a job, you're having your, um, uh, you've had medical bills. I could give my, my, my sermon about universal health care. That's a different topic. Um, you have, um, you have um, your, your teaser rate has just gone up, and, and you really haven't thought about how you would pay the higher rate. Um, if house, house prices are rising, you can resell the house um, and you know, just uh, escape gracefully. Or you may be able to refinance and get yourself a, a, a breathing space. But if house prices are falling and you have negative equity, you can't do any of that. So um, the, the uh, Boston Fed found that basically the rate at which home prices are rising or falling is the prime determinant of whether you have lots of foreclosures or not. Uh, and if you have a lot of borrowing that is, has put people at the point where they start to have ne negative equity if home prices start to come down a little bit, 
uh, then you have lots and lots of foreclosures, lots and lots of mortgages not being paid. And, uh, and foreclosing leads to big losses, not just because the house isn't worth the value of the mortgage, but also because the process itself. Uh, you end up having to sell the houses. The, 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 uh, the, the company that takes possession never, usually sells them at, at fire sale prices. Um, and how big is this? <coughs> Foreclosure rates are already at, at unprecedented levels. Uh, but if you, do a f back, if you do some calculations, it gets really terrifying. So I actually had that in, this, in morning's times. Um, if you, we have some data on what, how many people had how much home equity uh, in, uh, at the end of, of 2006. And we can, you can figure out from that if home prices decline by X percent, how many people will have negative equity, which puts them at high risk of foreclosure. Um, if home prices decline 20 percent from the, where they were at the end of last year, uh, we're talking about more than 13 million uh, homeowners with negative equity. If they decline more than 30 percent, which is my number for what I think is going to happen, uh, then we're talking about more than 20 million. Uh, we're talking about 40% of the homeowners in America having negative equity. <clears throat> so this is big stuff. And, um, and what's happened is that the, um, because the, although the, uh, we haven't had that many defaults yet, we had a lot, but not that many, because the prospects of this have become so dire, uh, the, uh, these collateralized debt obligations which were supposed to be the, the upper tranches were supposed to be really safe, um, are clearly not really safe. So there is something called ABX, which is actually, it's not exactly, it's, it's the price of insuring against default on these things. But it gives you, it can be read as, as the, uh, what people expect to get on the dollar. So the, the ABX is on tranches that were further down, things that were rated uh, double B. They were still at like 100% at the beginning of, of 2007. Um, they're now typically 18%. So the, the lower rated tranches have basically become worthless. Um, and the AAA tranches have fallen from like 100 to around 70. Uh, and um, this is telling you that you know, a lot of people who thought they were buying nice, safe assets, turned out they didn't know it, but they were buying junk bonds. And, uh, and <clears throat> all of this stuff is, uh, is out there. Now, um, OK, but so far you could say, well, this is just money lost. And you know people lose money, and if you try to work it through, uh, even if home prices fall 30 percent, well, you know that's uh, that's six trillion homes are you know about 20 trillion dollars in value, so it's six trillion dollars, and you know six trillion here, six trillion there. Soon you're talking about real money. Um, uh, <laughs> relative to the economy, that's still a bit smaller than the, than the stock price bust at the beginning of the decade, so that it might not seem that severe, but in fact, people who are serious uh, financial types are terrified. Um, and the reason is that a, a lot of this, um, this debt that has suddenly turned out to be bad is held by uh, key players in the financial system. So you have um, banks, uh, and, and all this stuff, exposure we didn't know they have is, turning, is coming to light. Banks, uh, non-bank financial intermediaries that do things that banks do but aren't formally called banks and, of course, don't have deposit insurance or any of that stuff, um, are taking these losses. And it's huge, and we don't know where it is. So basically, every week, we get two or three institutions saying, oh, by the way, we've got 10 billion of losses that you didn't even know we were exposed, but there we are. And, uh, and <coughs> <coughs> so an uh, example of a non-bank thing, that this fund that the uh, that Florida uh, schools were using essentially as a bank account, a place to park their money uh, until they needed it to buy textbooks and do building repairs and so on, uh, turned out to have be contaminated with subprime debt. And all of a sudden, the state um, is, had to stop withdrawals from this fund because their people were starting to get nervous about it and pull out. And so it's as if they had all these school districts had their money in a bank and suddenly the bank was closed, had to slam its doors. And so that sort of thing is happening um, throughout the economy. Uh, <coughs> and um, it's really scary because it means that a lot of the lending um, in the economy is grinding to a halt. Uh, some things are still going on. People are still able to borrow on their credit cards. Uh, housing is pretty, has suffered a terrific hit, but the, the rest of the economy is not yet showing clear signs of, of, uh, of being in deep trouble, but people think it's gonna be pretty bad because they're, they're, the whole credit mechanism has, uh, has frozen up. Um, 
so how does this, uh, how does this get worked out? <clears throat> so everybody's model for this, everybody's model for how it's supposed to be is what happened in 1998. And 1998, again, I think a lot of people in this room were in, uh, in grade school. But the, um, <laughs> um, in 1998, um, we'd been having a, a um, series of um, a, you know, financial dominoes falling all around the world. It had a crisis that began in Thailand, spread to uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea, um, worked its way. You know, there were, it was, it was. Um, it was really scary. Um, and then in, uh, in 1998, uh, Russia defaulted on its debt. And that triggered the collapse of long-term capital management, which was a hedge fund that wasn't actually that big in terms of capital, but was incredibly leveraged and was all over the place. And the markets really froze. And that was when uh, the president of the New York Fed told us that you should just pray for, uh, for this thing to, uh, to resolve itself. Um, but actually, it wasn't that they did better than that. Uh, the Fed orchestrated a rescue of, although it was done with private money, not, government, not taxpayers' money, a, a rescue of LTCM. Um, the Fed cut interest rates, um, extended money to banks through the, the discount window, um, and Alan Greenspan and Robert Rubin went around looking very confident. And, uh, and the thing just faded away. The crisis just faded away. Um, and that was supposed to be what happens when you have one of these crises. It's okay, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, um, Uncle Alan or now, now Uncle Ben uh, will come in and, and, uh, and soothe everybody and, and it'll all be all right. Uh, and that's more or less what <clears throat> they tried to do in August. Uh, in August, when the markets really were uh, started to seize up, uh, the Fed lent a lot of money to the banks, cut interest rates, uh, said, you know, we're, we're dealing with the problem. And in fact, a lot of these measures got better for a while. And then they started to get worse again. Um, and, uh, and I think we, we're starting to figure out, we, we, we actually understand why. And it's unfortunately, understanding is kind of uh, scary. Um, the, so there's a distinction, if you do uh, financial stuff, between liquidity and solvency problems. And if you read this morning's Times, you already know my, my example. But anyway, let me, let me repeat it for those who didn't. Um, think about, uh, I, I had the first bank of Potters, uh, Pottersville, uh, which um, I suspect that one in 300 readers got the reference. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, it's, from, it's a Wonderful Life from the movie. The, uh, in, in the bad existence in which Jimmy Stewart never existed, uh, the, the town is, is renamed Pottersville. And it's, it's Jimmy Stewart's bank. But anyway. Um, but the, uh, and, and, and it, I, you know, and imagine no deposit insurance. So you've got this bank and there's a rumor that the bank has made a terrible, a big bad loan and has lost a ton of money and is basically uh, in trouble. Um, even if the rumor is false, it can break the bank. Because if everybody tries to withdraw their money, banks don't keep all of your money in cash. They keep only a fraction of it. Uh, and they can't liquidate all of their other assets. At, or the, you know, they'd have to sell them at fire sale prices. The bank can go bust just because people think it's bust. It can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. A bank run can break an even sound bank. Um, but if there's a Federal Reserve, it can solve that problem. It can provide the bank with liquidity, the ability to raise cash, by simply extending a credit line for a little while. In fact. If it simply announces that it's extending a credit line, that might be enough to do it. Because if people, they, some people will be running the bank not because they, re, they believe the rumor about the bad loan, but because they think every other people are going to run the bank and break it. So if you can just break that psychology by, by making it clear that credit is available, you can solve the situation. And that, roughly speaking, is, uh, is what happened in 1998, this crisis, which show, seemed to show that the Fed can always bail us out. Um, but what if the bank really did make that bad loan? Then extending a credit line you know, doesn't do you any good. Because the, the trouble is that uh, what people are worried about at that point is not the fact that, that other people might run the bank. They're worried about the fact that the bank has actually uh, uh, thrown away your money on a really bad loan. And, uh, and that's a solvency problem. And what we're starting to think right now is that uh, this looks like a solvency problem. Basically, in August, when the Fed pumped a bunch of money into the system. Um, they, uh, people sort of breathed a sigh of relief, and the markets got better. And then more, more bad news about housing started coming out, and more revelations of, of un, 
uh, of not only of losses that you didn't know about, but of exposure that you didn't know about kept on coming out. And people said, oh, this is really not very good. And the, uh, all of the evidence that people are, are very, uh, you know, that there are real risks out there returned, um, <clears throat> which <clears throat> leaves you in kind of a quandary. So um, the, um, uh, by my count, there have now been four high profile, uh, we're going to save the financial system things uh, since, since all hell broke loose on, in, in the summer. Um, last night, I was informed that I could not, in the New York Times, say the phrase, all hell broke loose. Uh, so we changed it to, uh, uh, I, things started to go wrong, as I think what, what it became. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, first there was the Fed rescue of August, um, and that worked for a little while and then stopped working. Then there's the super sieve. Um, sieves are you know, special investment vehicles, which are things that uh, basically sell, uh, borrow short term and invest in stuff like, uh, like CDOs uh, that are backed by subprime mortgages. And, and there was this theory that somehow the banks, which had created all of these special investment vehicles to invest in this stuff, could solve the problem by all co combining together to create a super uh, special investment vehicle, which would buy the assets off the other uh, I never understood why that was supposed to work, um, but it was sort of a. It really, it really has the you know rearranging the deck chairs on the on the Titanic feel to it. But anyway, um, and that one, but it was a very big thing for a few weeks, and it sort of faded out, and it's it, it's uh, it's probably never going to happen, I think, at this point. Uh, then there's the Paulson plan, uh, which was we're going to get. Uh, the banks together, uh, not the banks, sorry, part of the problem is we don't have banks. We have, uh, you know, there, there are uh, mortgage originators which made the loans and then sold them off. But, and we were, they were going to establish a formula by which some mortgages that had mortgage rates that were about to reset, they're things that had a low teaser rate for two or three years and then reset, um, would postpone the reset. Um, and the idea there is that there are supposed to be, there, there, are, there are some people, no doubt, who can't pay, make the payments on their higher mortgage uh, as, as the rate goes up. But it would actually be better both for them and for the owners of the mortgage if they were allowed to work out some deal of, of paying less. Uh, that, that the costs of foreclosing uh, would be greater than the costs of um, of, of, uh, of giving them a break and letting them stay in the house. Um, the question you would ask, especially if you've spent too much time studying economics, is, well, if there's an advantage there, why won't they do it anyway? Uh, and the answer probably is that, look, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's complicated. There are actually not enough loan adjusters out there, uh, not enough people. And the, given the way that everything is sold on and on, uh, the ownership claims that you don't you can't get the people who own the mortgage together in a room to do this. So by establishing a kind of standard formula, the Treasury might be able to get some of this. You know, it, it might do some good. Uh, but I actually tried to do back of the envelope, and I cannot come up with any way this could be possibly worth more than a few billion dollars. And we're talking about at least four, I'd say at least $400 billion of, of losses to financial institutions and all this. So it's just not going to be big enough to, to, uh, to, to make a difference. And then we had, finally, this week, uh, the Fed came up with another rescue plan, which is basically a more complexly designed lending facility. And it's, uh, we're trying to figure out exactly how this is different, but it doesn't make all that much difference, uh, as far as I, I can tell. Um, I am entirely sympathetic to the efforts of the Fed. You know, this is a very hard time. And, but you should know that uh, I'm biased, because before he was demoted, um, Ben Bernanke was the chairman of the Princeton Economics Department. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> OK. Um, how does all this end? That's the, that's the interesting question. First question is, you know, is this going to mean a recession? And let me say with great certainty, I don't know. Um, and nobody knows. Because part of the problem is that this is absolute havoc in the financial markets. But we don't know how much all this matters, really, in the end. Uh, it's certainly bad for housing. But housing had already taken a huge plunge anyway. Um, how, much, how much worse can it get? Um, how much this interferes with the rest of business, we don't know. And um, there are signs. If, um, that they used to be, when I studied international economics as a grad student, we had the grand old uh, man, Charlie Kendallberger, 
teaching the course. And he, uh, he used to say about balance of payments numbers that there are so many ways to calculate them that you can be always optimistic or always pessimistic depending on your temperament. Uh, and that's a little bit the way the economic indicators look right now. So if I want to get really ominous, I can tell you about commercial real estate seems to be uh, hitting the tank now. On the other hand, consumer spending, nothing, apparently nothing can stop the American consumer. So. Um, <coughs> Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, I, I right now I'd, I'd say odds of of, a re of something that will formally be called a recession are about fifty percent. Um, but um, that's in a way there there's, there could be things that wouldn't actually be a recession, but would kind of feel like it. There could be recessions that would be sufficiently mild that it wouldn't feel all that terrible. Uh, I'd say about 15, 20 percent of something really, really bad, which is, but n the truth is nobody knows. It's a, this is all uncharted. We've never had this kind of financial mess before. So this is uh, no, no, no precedence. Um, how does it work out? Um, I look, I was trying to think about uh, what precedence we have for this. Um, and in the past 20 years, there have been, by my count, four big financial crisis type shocks uh, to the US economy. Obviously, other countries have had, had, had their, their own problems. Um, the uh, 87 stock market crash, um, that was handled very easily. It wasn't even a blip in terms of the economy, uh, basically because the, uh, it, nothing much was lost except some paper gains that people had and had some impact on consumer spending, but the Fed was able to cut rates and it just, the economy just sort of blew through it. Um, savings and loan crisis uh, that, that finally sort of became manifest at the end of the 80s was in, in some ways like this. Uh, the savings and loans had made a lot of bad loans. They, they'd made a lot of loans that they could not actually claim. Uh, but they were there, the, 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 uh, the debt, you might say, was held by depositors. It was not, they, they hadn't passed it on to, you know, through all this complex chain of stuff. And, um, and the deposits were insured by the federal government. And so what the thing ended up being was that the, uh, the federal government had to bail out the depositors. Um, and that ended up costing $150 billion which uh, would be the equivalent of something like 400 billion relative to the economy today. So it was a, a big, fairly big cost to the taxpayers, uh, but you know, it was, uh, didn't, didn't do that much to harm the economy. Um, and it was, it was not a question of, well, will Congress approve this money? Um, it was, it, we had already contracted to, uh, to, the deposits were insured by the federal government. So, so it was not a, no question. It was sort of an automatic thing to do that. Whereas if you were going to try and do something like that now, and say we're going to bail out the investors uh, with four or $500 billion of federal money, Oh boy, uh, you know, it, they would, there's, there's a lot of very undeserving investors that you'd be bailing. It'd be very difficult to imagine it actually happening. Um, 98, I've already talked about, uh, which was, it turned out, just a, you know, there was money lost in Russia. Um, there was money, but it wasn't that much relative to everything. It was just a, um, uh, yeah. So the, uh, the joke at the time was that, that we were, you know, people said we're throwing money down a rat hole in Russia, and, and, and the answer was no, we're throwing it down a missile silo. But anyway, the, uh, um, but it turned out that that was, uh, um, once, once people calmed down, which was fairly quickly, the thing went away, uh, and the tech, the tech bubble in, and its burst, which was more like 87, just paper losses, no real ramifications for the financial system. Uh, so now we have something entirely new. Um, and so I try, I'm trying to scope it out. I don't quite know. I mean, assume that we don't have a complete financial meltdown. Uh, the, who knows, right? We might. But in, in that case, uh, uh, all, all the rules change. Uh, that we just have a lot of trouble. Uh, and it, it hurts the economy, but doesn't destroy it. And it's kind of crazy. Um, it's very hard for me to see how we're going to do anything in terms of policy. Uh, we will. Uh, can we bail out the investors? Hard to see exactly how that happens. Uh, will we uh, be able to do some financial engineering that makes the thing go away? Hard to see how that happens. So I end up with this story, but I'm not sure if this is right, that what happens is that, that the financial markets remain kind of crippled, hobbled, uh, until house prices have fallen enough that they don't need to fall any further. And the banks and financial institutions have uh, eventually been forced to reveal all of their losses and some of them go bust and the rest become 
because they survived to become uh, good credit risks again, and the, the thing, uh, uh, and, and life gradually returns to normal. But it is amazing. I mean, we managed, what, what strikes me, I'm just, I'm going to do Q&A at this point. What strikes me is the sheer sort of uh, gratuitousness of the whole thing. I mean, you can, uh, again, coming back, you can understand, we had this technological boom bust uh, at the, in, in the 90s, which was, well, you know, there, there was uh, this thing called the internet, and it was very exciting, and no one quite knew what it would turn into in terms of profits, and, and so it made sense, in a way, for people to get all excited and, and engage in some wild speculation. Here, there was nothing, it was just houses. Um, and somehow, uh, we managed to convince ourselves, or be convinced, that. Uh, that everything was uh, was different, and we got this crazy, extremely risky financial structure built on top of it, and uh, and then the whole thing collapsed. Um, and uh, the people who sort of engineered all of this uh, have now uh, walked away in disgrace with uh, severance payments of about 150 million each, and uh, and there we are. It's it's an incredible story, um, and uh, somebody. I'd like to see somebody punished, but I can't see that that's ever actually going to happen. Thank you. <laughs> so, how do we do this? Yeah. So, yeah, that looked like, yes, is there a uh, roving mic? So. Um, I had a question that, that I thought was going to be off topic until you're closed. And it's basically the, the idea of people who profit by destroying value, which seems to be sort of the, the, the way the Bush administration does things. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the end game? I don't, I don't really see what's going on except all these people are getting rich for, by causing damage. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a, it's a um, I mean, to a certain extent, um, you know the the, the um, we are these these are the days of uh, when when the the uh, the big bucks in the economy uh, are made in finance. Finance is is, is the core. If you look at uh, uh, you know where does the uh, where does the top hundredth of a percent uh, come from? Who are the people making really very large incomes in this in this economy? And they, it turns out that although there are you know. Um, uh, captains of industry and, and creators of, of spectacular information technology firms in there. There are not very many. That's mostly not it. It's mostly people doing, mostly people you've never heard of doing financial engineering on Wall Street. Um, and, uh, and there's very little evidence that it's creating value. Um, it's, so I, I don't know what, why it's, it persists. Uh, uh, there's, it, it just, um, it, I think for, it, people keep on coming up with strategies that appear to make money for their investors for a few years, and then crash and burn, and end up not making money uh, on balance. But they do make a lot of money for the people who originate them. And then along comes another one. It's kind of a, a P.T. Barnum uh, uh, market, uh, suckers born every minute. It's an amazing thing. And I don't know what, how, how it comes to an end. We just keep on. There seems to be um, no learning in this process, unless we have you know, real full financial meltdown, in which case, we have what happened in the, in the 30s with with bank regulation and the you know the the, the financial markets being uh, being disciplined. But no, it's an amazing thing. Um, I'm I'm supposed to be selling my own book, which is uh, about none of this. But uh, there is a uh, uh, there is this um, great book though. Uh, but it's a um, the uh, one of my classmates from grad school, uh, Richard Bookstaber, went off to become a Wall Street quant guy. And he has a book called A Demon of Our Own Design, uh, which is, he seems to have been on the scene for many of the financial disasters of, of the past 20 years. And, uh, and what strikes me is that people, it, it is really a story of people devising supposed money-making machines that each of which works for about two years and then blows up in the, in the investors' faces. And it's just one after another after another. So I don't know, I don't know how it all ends. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I just recently read what, what appeared to be a great book about um, the 
history of the financial crisis of 1907. Yeah. It was called the crisis of 1907, which is sort of like a bedtime reading if you want your kid to grow up to be a banker because uh, J.P. Morgan saves the day. Right. But um, I was sort of curious, uh, do you have any sort of commentary on sort of um, what historical episodes are most like what we're seeing with sort of the subprime meltdown? And um, is there anything we can learn from that? Yeah, I mean, the subprime meltdown, the uh, first... In, I'm not sure you can find anything quite like it, but the... Um, because we have this securitized financial system where banks, where, where banks are replaced by these sort of vast networks of, uh, uh, of holding, which are with, where there doesn't seem to be um, any center of control. So that's kind of new. But in terms of the underlying finance, it is like the savings and loan crisis of the, uh, um, uh, of the, the late 80s in the sense that there are a lot of basically unrecoverable lending, um, or um, kind of uh, like the, uh, the great bank crises of 1930 and 31, which uh, much more than the stock market crash of 29 caused the Great Depression. Uh, it's, um, uh, actually, this was just last night. I was thinking about the story, the story I've been telling, and I suddenly realized there was a phrase that uh, actually goes back to the great economist Irving Fisher trying to make sense of the Depression, uh, debt deflation. Uh, and what we're actually seeing here is a case of debt deflation in, 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 uh, due to the housing market. And uh, so this is, now we hope it's a, it's a minor key version of 3031, but that's the closest example. Oh, the 1907 was like 1998. It was a, a, a panic, a crisis of confidence, but fundamentally the system was fairly sound. So if J.P. Morgan could corral everybody into sort of um, holding each other's hands for a little while and singing Kumbaya, the, uh, um, the markets could recover, which is more or less you know, what, what Alan Greenspan did in 98. Um, we tried that. As I said, we tried that. Uh, I, I know what we did last summer. Uh, uh, we, we, did, we did that in August. And the trouble was, although people calmed down for a little while, they fairly quickly realized, actually, that was, uh, <laughs> there was very good reason to be afraid. Thank you for that shocking vision of things to come. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay, I hope I hope you don't mind me switching topics to stuff That's that fine. might I'm be more relevant to the book. Maybe I don't know. Sure, I'm, I'm happy. I haven't read the book yet. Uh, this is but, reverse. Actually, um, normally when I give book talks, they I talk about the book, and then somebody wants to know about the financial market. So this time we can do it the other way around. <laughs> okay. So so I know you care a lot about inequality, and I wanted to ask uh, which of two inequalities uh, is more important to you, or, or more important to you or more important normatively if those happen to be different, I don't know. Um, the, the, the sort of inequality between the rich in the US and the poor in the US um, or the inequality between the poor in the US and the poor in the rest of the world, the poor poor in the rest of the world, so bottom billion, dollar a day kind of, kind of yeah. people without detailed definition of those. Yeah, OK. No, on a human basis, um, the, the poverty of the third world just swamps anything in that, that happens in the US in terms of, of what to be concerned about. <clears throat> and um, if uh, if there was a uh, a world, uh, you know, if I had to make a choice between improving the living standards of, of the poor in America and improving the living standards of of the poor in Africa, uh, clearly the poor in Africa, it, it's it's much more vital. But you know, it's not a choice. And in fact, if you really look at at uh, at what actually happens in terms of who gives aid. Who, who, who actually supports development in the third world? It turns out that the societies that are most um, concerned with redressing poverty and inequality in, at home are also the ones that give the most foreign aid. So uh, the US is incredibly stingy compared with other, um, other advanced countries. Uh, Sweden is incredibly generous compared with other advanced countries. So it isn't really a trade off. There's a question about personally what you should be working on. You know, it should. Uh, 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 if, if you're a, someone who cares about inequality um, and you're, should, should you be working on global poverty or should you be working on domestic? And I think the answer is you, know, you have to figure out what you can do best yourself. So uh, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Sachs is, is trying to do a lot for the third world. I don't think, uh, I don't think adding my uh, voice to it would make much difference. So, <coughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it, Sure. In, in the in, from from the uh, from from the um, from orbit, the uh, the inequality um, between nations is vastly greater than the inequality within nations. But on the other hand, not to 
you know, it's it, nonetheless the fact that we have a very rich country with a lot of remarkably poor people in it is something to be concerned about. Uh, oh, so, so the obvious follow-up question is, um, you know, I think I can take, you know, thinking, looking forward to the presidential election in this country, right? I think I can uh, sort of figure out on my own uh, which political party and which candidates will do what for the inequality of the U.S., uh, rich to poor. Yeah. But um, so, so tell me your opinion on which of the Democratic frontrunners and which of the Republican frontrunners will do the best job at raising the lot of the international poor, you know, taking into account not just amount of aid, but trade and the other things that affect that. Oh, boy. Hard to know. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. I, I, it's hard to know because I think nobody's going to do very much. If, if, when all is said and done, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of aid, it's deeply unpopular in this country. Um, it's, you, we would, I, just based on historical experience, I would guess that any Democrat will end up giving more aid than any Republican just because the, the, um, of the inherent sort of uh, um, e ethos of the parties. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, but it's just it's, it's politically very difficult, partly because the public has a, a why you know a, a wildly distorted notion of how much foreign aid we give. Right? It's the, uh, um, I mean, I was, I've talked to uh, you know highly trained professionals, but not in in, in economics, um, and they say you know we would have enough money to deal with our problems if we didn't give so much in foreign aid. And you know, it, it, but the truth is, of course, basically we give essentially nothing in foreign aid. So it's, uh, um, but yeah, and on trade issues, um, there is this question. You know, it's, if if I thought that somebody was going to turn radically protectionist and shut off the ability of Bangladesh to sell apparel in the United States, which is the only thing that keeps them literally, I think, keeps their their heads above water, um, then that would be a concern. But I don't think that's going to happen. There are some more protectionist noises from some of the Democrats, but I think uh, it, we're, we're not talking about anything that would be radically disruptive. So that, that's the story. And if you want to vote for a candidate on what they're going to do for third world poverty, you're going to have a hard time because uh, in, in the US political process, that just doesn't rate as an issue. <coughs> two more. OK, I can only take two more, I'm told. Hi. Okay. Um, so previously you said you weren't too concerned about the dollar's devaluation versus uh, international yeah. currencies, but uh, recently Iran said that they were looking to stop denominating their oil prices in dollars yeah. and move over to a different basket of uh, uh, currencies and urging other OPEC nations to do the same. Yeah. Do you think that that would um, change your opinion on the dollar's prices? Um, okay, no. And let's, let's just talk about the... So uh, th there, I, have, I actually have sort of multiple layers of indifference on here. So, uh, um, so first off, what they denominate the price in doesn't matter at all. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, even on, at the most sort of shallowest level, you might want to ask, well, yeah, but what do they accept payment in? The fact that the price might be, uh, might be indexed. Uh, um, so it's not clear that they would accept payment in something other than dollars, even, even so. You, know, you, you, can, you can index the thing to the yen, but if it's a, uh, um, and then, even if they accept payment um, in euros, um, that doesn't mean that people are going to be having to have big bags of euros to pay Iran. Right? This stuff is done with with uh, with wire transfers on bank accounts, that, and there, there's there's essentially no green stuff involved. So there's very little effect on the holding of dollars. And even if people do switch out of dollar holdings, which I think is is starting to happen and will happen more. Uh, as countries diversify their reserves and so on, uh, and the dollar falls, um, how bad a thing is that? So the cases where uh, plunging currency are really disastrous um, are cases like Argentina in 2002. And the problem there was that Argentina had all of this debt in dollars. And so, and basically every company and many individuals in Argentina had debt in dollars and assets in pesos. And when the peso plunged to a third of its value, everybody went bankrupt. Uh, and that's the, that's the kind of thing. Now, the United States, uh, well, we also have a lot of debts in dollars. Uh, so, but, but our assets are also in dollars. So uh, if you actually look at it, US balance sheets, when the dollar falls, the balance sheets of both the US as a whole and of US corporations get better 
because they have assets abroad in, in euros or other currencies, and they have dollar debts, and so they actually, the balance sheet, you know, the balance sheet thing is actually positive when the dollar falls. Uh, inflation is a concern a little bit. Prices of imports go up when the dollar falls, but not as much as you might think. So uh, this is, it turns out that a lot of foreigners um, tend to absorb when the dollar falls, they absorb a lot of the change in their margins so that the price, import prices don't go up all that much. And it's, uh, there is a question. I mean, we, we have not seen, we, I was just at a conference uh, on all of this stuff last week. And uh, um, we know that that's the case when the dollar falls against the euro or against the yen, that the prices of, of Japanese or European goods don't go up that much. Um, we don't know uh, what will happen if and when China allows its currency to go up. Will the uh, uh, you know, the, the classic thing is that prices of German luxury cars don't go up very much when the euro goes up. Uh, but we don't know what will happen to the prices of uh, poison toys and tainted seafood if the yuan goes up. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> um, well, this is a running joke now. We now have, we now have fair, fair trade with China. They send us poison toys. We send them uh, fraudulent securities. So, uh, <laughs> um, so there's an inflation issue. And, and it's actually, there's a little, but, but it, it's very hard. I, I've tried to tell a story about the dollar, a falling dollar creating a crisis here, and I can't. The U.S. just doesn't look like the kind of economy for which that is a problem. Oh, thank you. <coughs> I think one more. So, so um, we negotiated, so this is a kind of a two-part question. Okay. <laughs> That's... <laughs> so um, first of all, we're wondering is like if, as your um, estimate or guesstimate or whatever, the housing market falls by 30%, how can that not cause a recession? And secondly, um, the um, <coughs> given that there are regulations on things like how much you can buy on margin that are supposed to protect the financial system, um, do you think we'll ever see regulations on like basically having to put a certain amount of money down to buy a house or on yeah. straightening out these teaser rates so that, especially when there's an obviously a, bu a bubble going on that maybe the Fed could do something to try to deflate it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first, um, okay, the thing is about housing is that the, the direct effect of plunging housing construction um, has already mostly happened and hasn't generated a recession yet. So it's, uh, so, so I, which is a surprise. I would have expected there to be a lot more direct impact just from the fact that, that home construction has gone down so much. One of the mysteries is that the, uh, according to the U.S. government figures, housing construction, employment in residential construction is down only about 5% from its peak despite the fact that the amount of residential construction is down about 40% from its peak. And we think that's <clears throat> probably a mixture of things. Uh, part of it is that it, many people employed in construction are sort of contractors who are self-employed, so they're not counted as unemployed, but they're just working a lot less. The other is that a lot of them are probably uh, um, illegal aliens working off the books. And so uh, they, they've disappeared. Uh, they, they can't disappear from the employment roles because they were never on to begin with. So, but, but still, the um, the thing is that it's given how that we've had so much of a plunge and it hasn't done that much to the economy. It's uh, it's not for certain. It's going to slow the economy, right? And if the U if the U.S. economy grows one percent over the next year, that will cause the unemployment rate to shoot up probably to uh, uh, five and a half to six percent. Um, it will feel like a recession, but it probably won't meet the uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research recession dating business cycle dating committee probably won't consider it to quite meet the formal criteria for a recession. So, so uh, that's the thing. Um, restrictions, yeah. I mean, I think the look. The fact of the matter is that in uh, Edward M. Gramlich, the, the late Ned Gramlich, um, was calling for the Fed to at least establish guidelines, if not actual regulations, on subprime lending uh, way back in the early years of this decade. And it's clear that they could have done that. And they did not do it because um, Alan Greenspan 
uh, said, well, first of all, it is not possible to have a housing bubble, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that markets would, would sort this out. So it was an ideological predisposition against doing anything. And I would think that it certainly would make a lot of sense to, to start thinking about some prudential regulations on all of this <coughs> to, to limit uh, uh, to, to limit uh, what these kinds of risks. Now, what people always say is, oh, but then you'd be closing off the channel for, uh, for less advantaged people to, uh, to, to own homes. Uh, you know? And the thing, I, I actually was just ripped out from today's Wall Street Journal, something because the uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, I think, said something about we mustn't uh, overregulate because subprime lending is so important to promoting home ownership for less advantaged people in this country. Um, to which my argument is, but you know, that actually didn't happen. Um, most of the subprime lending took place in 2004, 2005, 2006. Home ownership is already back down to the levels of 2003 now. We had a little spurt in home ownership, and it was all a part of the bubble, and it's gone, right, gone away all over again, so it never happened. Whether it's going to happen, um, whether it, it should happen, whether it will happen, I have, uh, I have my doubts. The, uh, the thing that you should realize is that even after this administration is gone, I forgot to bring my little, I, you know, I have a little countdown clock that says, you know, there are 403 <laughs> days, six hours. And, uh, the, um, um, and even if it is a uh, Democratic president and Democratic Congress, uh, Wall Street uh, still carries a lot of clout. And um, it may not, I, I'm not sure that we're ready yet to admit that some, sometimes the market is, is, not, is not right. Uh, but but we'll, we'll see. I mean, the, the case for it will, will be quite strong. And because this is, again, if, if those worst projections come out, if we have, you know, 40% of homeowners in America with negative equity, I think that will concentrate a few people's minds. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>